All right, contracts are written and tested. Can I ship my code? No, I can easily break this with a flash loan attack. Ah, oh, crap, I didn't think about that. Let me fix. All right, how about now? <laughs> I'm like a flash loan on Ave. I can use that loan to lock up a CDB on FakerDAO, and I can exploit the Oracle by re-entering your dinner reservation at Chili's, causing a bridge malfunction on the flux capacitor, bypassing the possibility media I can exploit your contract. I exploit your contract. Most of the time, hacks will come from a scenario that you didn't think about or write a test for. But what if I told you that you could write a test that cannot check for just one scenario, but every scenario? Let's get froggy. Fuzz testing or fuzzing is when you supply random data to your system in an attempt to break it. So if this balloon is our system slash code, it's us doing random stuff in an attempt to break it. <coughs> this is chain link. Now, why would we want to do all that? Let's say we have this function called do stuff. It takes an integer as an input parameter, and we know that no matter what we give it as an input, our variable should always be zero, should always be zero. The fact that this variable should always be zero is known as our invariant, or our property of the system that should always hold. In our balloon example, if we market our balloon as indestructible or unbreakable or unpoppable, the invariant that would hold would, this balloon cannot be broken. And unlike this balloon in real life, we can write a test that will call the do stuff function many times with random data and check to see that our should always be zero variable is always zero. Now, a normal unit test for our code might look like this. We pass a single data point, we call the function, and then we do our assertion to make sure that should always be zero is in fact zero. And with this, we might think our code is covered. But if we look back at our do stuff function a little bit closer, we can clearly see that if our data input is two, should always be zero will end up being one. This would break our invariant. Should always be zero will not be zero. Now this may seem obvious for this function, but sometimes you'll have a function that looks like this. It would be insane to write a test case for every single possible integer or scenario, so we need a programmatic way to find this scenario. Now in our code, we also see a second exploit, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now there are two popular methodologies to find these edge cases, fuzz tests slash invariant tests and symbolic execution slash form of verification. We'll save the latter for another video. If we were writing our code in Foundry, this would be our unit test. Writing a fuzz test in Foundry where we do all this random inputting is gonna be really similar. Instead of us manually selecting our data, right in our test parameter, we'll add our variable, comment out this line, and that's it. Now, when we run a Foundry test here, Foundry will automatically randomize data, run through our code with a ton of different examples. This is as if they run with data equals zero, data equals one, data equals this number, that's a T, but whatever, you get the picture. Now, if I run my unit test, you'll see that the unit test actually passes. However, if we run this fuzz test, you'll see it actually gives us an output where it says assertion violated counterexample gives us the call data, and the arguments. It was able to find out by randomly throwing data at our function call that two breaks our invariant, AKA it makes it such that should always be zero is not zero. Now it's really doing semi-random data instead of purely random data. And the way your fuzzer picks the random data matters. It won't be able to go over every single possible UN256. So understanding how your fuzzers pick the random data is an advanced thing that you should learn later on. At the moment, I think the trail of bits echidna slash optic integration is probably the best fuzzer out there and it easily has the best logo of all time, but ripped Jesus is a solid second. So now that we have our counter example here, we can use this to go back into our contract, find out, ah, okay, so we are doing this wrong, delete this line, and then run our test again and see that it does indeed pass. What's important is this number down here, the number of runs. So this did 256 different random inputs to make our test run. In Foundry, you can change the number of runs in your foundry.toml file by just adding a section like this, rerunning your tests, and now you'll see it did a thousand different examples. The number of runs is really important, obviously, because more runs is more random inputs, more use cases, more chance that you'll actually catch the issue. And now congrats, that's the basic of fuzz testing. Let's just do a little recap here before going further. The first thing you need to do is understand our invariant or property of the system that must always hold. And our example should always be zero was our invariant. Understand your invariant and then write a test that would input random data to try to break that invariant. Now, if we go back to our example contract though, you'll see with our fuzz test, we were able to find this first use case. However, it didn't find this second scenario where should always be zero was set to one if hidden value was seven. In order for this to revert, hidden value would need to be seven. And the only way to set hidden value to seven 
would be to first call do stuff with seven, which would set hidden value down here, and then call do stuff again with anything. Our fuzz test as written would never be able to find this. That's because this fuzz test is known as a stateless fuzz test, which is where the state of the previous run is discarded for the next run. If we go back to our balloon example, stateless fuzzy would be doing something to the balloon for one fuzz run, then discarding that balloon and blowing up a new balloon for each fuzz run. However, instead of doing stateless fuzzing, we could do stateful fuzzing. Stateful fuzzing is where the ending state of our previous fuzz run is the starting state of the next fuzz run. For example, instead of blowing up a new balloon for each one of these runs, we just use the same balloon to do multiple random things to it. Combined is considered one fuzz run. So a single fuzz run on a stateless fuzz run would be having data be seven, calling do stuff, just using the same contract that we just called do stuff on, and then call another function on it. If this was a unit test we had, we would of course see this get violated. But as you can see, with sufficiently complicated code, coming with these very specific scenarios are going to be missed. To write a stateful fuzz test in Foundry, you need to use the invariant keyword and it requires a little bit of setup. And don't get too confused by the invariant keyword here. Yes, it's being a little overloaded. Write an invariant test in Foundry, we first need to import this STD invariant contract and inherit it in our test contract. Then we need to tell Foundry which contract to call random functions on. Since we only have one contract with one function, we're going to tell Foundry that my contract should be called and it's allowed to call any of the functions in my contract. So we'd say, hey, the target contract for you is going to be the address of example contract. Foundry is smart enough to know, OK, it's going to grab any and all of the functions from my contract and call them in random orders with random data. So it's going to call do stuff with random data, and then it's going to call do stuff with random data, and then it's going to call do stuff with random data since do stuff is the only function. Now we can write our invariant by saying function invariant test always is zero public. And we can just add our assert. Assert our example contract that should always be zero is zero. So it'll run do stuff with some random data. If it happens across seven, it'll set hidden value to seven, and then it'll call do stuff again with hidden value starting at seven, which will trigger this conditional. So now if we run this test, we can see it does indeed find a sequence where our invariant or our assertion or our property is broken. We can see first on my contract, it's going to call do stuff with an argument of seven, and then it's going to call my contract with an argument of some random number because it doesn't matter what the input is after it sets it to seven. So now that we have that, we can go back to our code, remove this, come back to our test, rerun our test, and we'll find that. Our code is now safe and sound because our invariants hold up. Now, an important aside on the term invariant, Foundry uses the term invariant to describe this stateful fuzzing. Stateless fuzzing is when you give random data to an input to a function to see if it breaks some invariant. Stateful fuzzing is when you give random data and random function calls to a system to see if it breaks some invariant. In Foundry, fuzzing is stateless fuzzing and invariants are stateful fuzzing. So when people are talking about invariants in Foundry, they're usually talking about stateful fuzzing. If they talk about fuzzing in Foundry, they're talking about stateless fuzzing, even though they're both technically fuzzing. There's an issue on the repo to potentially change the name, but I digress. So in a real smart contract, your invariant won't be that a balloon shouldn't pop or some function should always be zero. It might be something like new tokens minted is less than the inflation rate. There should only be one winner in a random lottery. Someone shouldn't be able to take more money out of the protocol than they put in. And let me tell you what, at this point, congratulations, you've learned the basics of fuzzing. This is something that even some of the top protocols in this space don't use. And this is something that we in Cypherin use to find high severity vulnerabilities in smart contracts. Hey, I'm Alex Rohn, co-founder at Cypherin. We use invariant tests during our audits to identify vulnerabilities that are often difficult to catch purely with manual reviews. That's not to say they're a silver bullet. They are in no way a replacement for experts' manual review, but they certainly can aid in the audit process. This needs to be the new floor for security in Web3. If you're working with a protocol that isn't doing stateful fuzzing or invariant or fuzz tests, red flag, get them to use it, make a PR. Number one, understand what the invariants are. Number two, write functions that can execute them. Do not go to audit without these. And don't let your auditors let you get away with not having them. So this video was just to give you the basics. And if you want to learn the advanced fuzzing strategies on how to fuzz like pro, be sure to watch our next video on the topic as that'll give you the keys to write professional fuzz and professional invariant tests. Come on, gang. Let's make Web3 better and I'll see you next time.